to worship comes from Psalm. It says, All the nations you have made will come and worship before you, O Lord. They will bring glory to your name, for you are great and do marvelous deeds. You alone are God. Join us in worship this evening.
It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the wild animals and all the birds in the sky. He brought them to the man to see what he would name them. And whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds in the sky, and all the wild animals. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. The man said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they become one in flesh. Adam and his wife were both naked, and they felt no shame. Our New Testament reading tonight is from Matthew chapter 6, the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus is speaking to those who are followers of his. They've made a decision to leave their other pursuits and follow Jesus. Listen carefully to his teachings. The way Matthew presents the Sermon on the Mount is interesting. There's a large crowd of individuals who have a mix in it of those who are only curious and have made no commitment to Christ and those who are called disciples. But then Jesus left the crowds, went up on the mountainside, which was quite a bit more inaccessible, and sat down. He wasn't going to project his voice. He wasn't going to be able to be seen by huge crowds of people. He was talking to those who had clearly made a decision that changed their lives in following him. And Matthew says he taught his disciples. These words are then a collection of those statements Jesus made to those who had already grappled with their personal need of him and chose to follow him. He's speaking to those who were the earliest followers. Starting in verse 25, Matthew chapter 6, verse 25. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns. And yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are they not much more valuable than, are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow? They do not labor or spin, yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So, so do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what, what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow. For tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. We're looking at the system of exposure emotions. How God designed us. We are thoroughly human. But that humanity is in the design and image of God. We are made in his likeness. That is damaged, to be sure. But even in the design of God, he did not make us to be separate from him, independent, not needing a relationship with him. 
not in any way uh, able to go our own way. We are not wound up like clocks and just simply left to run and keep time. He made us to need him. So all of our knowledge, like God's knowledge, is partial. Him is, his is limitless. Our ability to act and to create, to shift, to design, to name. Adam had the role of naming everything, and that was its name. He was creative. He was insightful. But in portion, God without portion. We are able to remember, not perfectly, our own imagination and our memories fail us and change the details at times. God's memory is flawless. So where we are not like the remainder of creation, which functions either by mere physics or by instinct at best, we are made in the image of God, thoroughly human by God's design. We will find as we go through this entire series that the scripture always demonstrates Jesus himself was thoroughly human. Thoroughly human. The things we feel, he felt. Hebrews chapter 12 or 4 says, in every way he was tempted as we are, he struggled with the same things we struggle with. He's human, thoroughly human by God's design. Yet he did not sin in that struggle, in that temptation. And we're going to find that the way God has made us is not in any way bad. He said it is good when he made us, even with our emotions, even with our flightiness, our inability to remember perfectly, our inability to act in every way right. It is good. So we're going to look at the system of emotions. Not a bad system. Kent and Diana Eikenberry had a church they went to, and they went to church one week, and there was a new couple there about their age. They got chatting after church. And Kent, Kent and Diana were commenting about the neighborhood in which they lived, that it was so friendly, and it was a wonderful place to live. And they just enjoyed their neighbors and their street and the calmness and the way it was set up. They just loved it, and they were so glad that these new people had come to church and they were really hoping that they could get to be friends. One thing to have a friendly church, another thing entirely to have a church where you actually make good friends. But this new couple at church seemed bothered by their neighborhood. It was a struggle. Their people there weren't friendly. Nobody had really talked to them. They had moved in a few days before and been looking for a church to just stumble upon this one. So they were kind of discouraged and kind of lamenting where they had left, and they had so many friends there, but they came into this new neighborhood, and it's just tough. So Kent and Diana said, well, maybe we can get together, and and, and it would just be great, because our neighborhood is a wonderful place. So Kent and Diana drove home and noticed the car of the new people at church pulled in next door to theirs. What do you say next? Expose your emotions have to do with when we feel unsafe or insecure. From the very, very earliest moments of life, the ability to be frightened, to be startled, is built into us. Nobody teaches an infant a startle reflex. God has designed in the brain at its base a small part of the brain called the amygdala. That's a Greek word for almond. Because the amygdala of the brain are almond-shaped and very small. When a person is startled, someone comes up quietly behind you and pinches you in the sides, and you jump. When an infant is suddenly dropped, when there's a loud sound that catches you by surprise and you don't have enough experience to know what that sound is or what it means, it is an involuntary reflex to be startled. The irises of your pupils of your eye will expand. Your hearing becomes more acute. Everything about you, everything in your life, becomes highly aware of your surroundings, even in the youngest infants. That's true. This is not a bad part of our life. It's not a bad emotion. 
to feel exposed. Exposure and the feelings of anxiety or fear, nervousness, terror, may come from external forces. As you perceive the world around you, there are things you don't know. You have no idea what someone is going to do. That in a series of events, you may be surprised or hurt or even destroyed by some force or factor outside of yourself. And it can stimulate feelings of exposure, of feeling at risk. It can be from internal forces, from either realities or imagination or history. It is your experience that tells you it is a good time to be afraid. It is something that you've done that causes feelings of guilt. It's the way in which you have entered into a circumstance that is unstable, and you don't know if you have the skill or the luck or the chance to escape harm. Very much like the need in acceptance to love and to be loved. It is built into our design, and it is a good part of our design. Feeling afraid is a good part of our design. As a matter of fact, as the story is told in Genesis 3, if Adam and Eve had had a sense of caution, if they were nervous about this serpent, if they were afraid of what they were being told, the outcome of the story might have been different, but it's not. There was a certain amount of fear they lacked in their experience. What's interesting is to see how that story begins to develop. The need to be safe and to feel secure is a key part of our design. It is a good feeling. Let's take a glance at exposure feelings. We're going to start at the bottom and work our way up. The way I see these is the same emotion, whatever you call it, has different levels of intensity, and ultimately it is what are you willing to do, to what extent will you expend your resources, your time, your effort, your life to achieve safety, security, resolve, protection. What will you do to accomplish it? Let's start at the bottom. A very low-level emotion is shyness. The Bible talks about that quite a bit. As a matter of fact, there's numerous stories throughout Scripture where, where individuals were embarrassed or cautious about appearing, about coming forward. When David, when they're looking for a king for Israel, Saul, at the very beginning, is from a very tiny family. He's a massive man, but he's described as being almost low self-esteem. He didn't want to be found. David was the same way. The youngest kid in a family of older brothers, he didn't feel like he fit there. Mary, when she's approached by the angel about the, the annunciation of Christ, is, is unnerved by that. When they're looking for Jesus and can't find him in the caravan, they're anxious about it. All the way through, these feelings are communicated. When Paul writes to the Corinthians, he says, at the very beginning, I was timid among you. When I was face to face, I was, I was just unsure how you would respond. When I wrote letters, I was very bold. But not when I came into your, into your church or into your community, I was just very uneasy. He doesn't use a strong word. He wasn't terrified. That wasn't in Paul's nature relative to people. But as well-educated and as much of a leader of the church as Paul actually was, he says, I was timid among you. I was shy. I, w I wasn't certain what my position would be and what our relationship was. Paul was a great man. His timidity or his shyness was appropriate, and it helped him in terms of relating to these people. Well, a step above that is embarrassment. There's an interesting story in 2 Kings when Elisha is called upon <clears throat> either to bless or to curse a certain group of people, and a man comes in and says, I want to know that you are going to 
bless the king and tell him he is going to recover. He says, but he's not going to recover. He says, but I need you to say he's going to recover. Please tell me he's going to recover. He says, I can't say he's going to recover. I can't lie. The man persisted and pushed and, and, and kept at him. And he finally says, okay, I'm going to tell you what you want to hear. He's going to recover. But then Elisha stared at the man until he was embarrassed. It was a very interesting moment. As the story is being told, this individual is pressing the prophet of God to say what he wants to hear. And so in response, he says, I'm going to tell you that, but I want to make eye contact. Do you really want me to tell you just what you want to hear, or do you want to know the truth? And that man became incredibly uncomfortable. It's a fascinating story in the event of the prophet. Well, let's go a, bit, a little bit higher than that. Fear. You might want to simply say this whole system is a system of fear. That it's extremely low level or very high level. And all these words are some version of fear or anxiety. Paul writes to the, the uh, Romans, The spirit you received does not make you slaves to live in fear of Almighty God or of the world or of sin. You perceive that those things are more powerful than you, but they're not. You have a resource to overcome sin. You have the Spirit of Almighty God dwelling in you. And I know that there are times at which you go back into the world of your immersion and you're just caught there. Your hair is on end, your, your startle reflex is engaged. You used to go there, you know what's going to happen, you know what people are going to say and what they're going to do, and you feel like you don't have enough to deal with that. But the Spirit of God is not one that will give you fear. Paul writes to Timothy, who's a very young pastor in a very aggressive church, God did not give you a spirit of timidity or fear, but of power and of strength and of truth. Let's go above fear. I think that guilt and shame... The sense of guilt, whether true guilt or false guilt, is a function of fear. We find that in Adam and Eve, in the story that's told there. We're going to look at that in just a moment. In Ezra, ch chapter 8, Ezra is the, the spiritual leader of the nation. He is charged with rebuilding the temple so that worship can commence again according to the Old Testament law. To reestablish a Levitical priesthood to be able to bring the proper animals in so the people could be forgiven for their sins. And Ezra, this man who is anointed by God to build the temple and to lead the Levitical priesthood, is advised by his associates, go to the king and ask him for soldiers and horsemen, warriors, to protect you as you go out and get materials and bring them back to Jerusalem and rebuild. And, and Ezra says... I was ashamed. He uses a word, an incredibly intense word. I was ashamed to go and ask the king for soldiers and for horsemen for protection because I had boldly said to the king of Persia, when you walk with God, you can do anything. I boldly proclaimed my faith and said, we need nothing from you, nothing at all. And his advisor saying, you know, you really do need some help here. But Ezra said, I was ashamed to ask that. I just couldn't do it. And then God actually did protect them. But it's interesting to see Ezra, a great leader, grappling with a feeling. He had said something wrong. He had spoken too quickly. He wasn't sure of the outcome. And that created shame in him. Then at a very high level, terror Distress and anguish fill the man who is wicked with terror. Troubles overwhelm him. One of the friends of Job says, it's actually a soliloquy from one of his associates. He is saying to Job, awful things have come your way. Why? There's only one reason. That is, you have sinned so badly that God has made all these things happen to you. That's the only reason why it would happen. 
you must be an awful, awful person. So just simply confess your sin and get it over with. And Job debates through his entire book with that concept. No. There are times when I am filled with terror. I have no idea what's going to happen. But I am not a sinner in the way in which you're describing I have always done what was right, yet my life is filled with anguish and pain and hurt and loss. I am terrified of what is going to happen, but that does not prove I'm wrong. And Job, throughout his book, uses incredibly intense emotional words. While testifying, this is not evidence that I am wrong or have lived wrong. It's my response to the world around me. And I know God is up to something, something big, and I don't know what it is. I have no idea why he's permitting these things. But it's not because of my personal sin. So all the way through the spectrum, I have about 45 more words in this area that have to do with the feelings of insecurity and a lack of safety. What's the cause of that? It's who you are and how you see yourself in relationship to the world around you and how you perceive that. The power of God, or that that's not available to you. The presence of God and his, his majestic holiness, and then that you have somehow stepped away from that. Of enemies that either are fabricated in your mind or actual and real with threats that have been issued against you, or perhaps actual pain that has been inflicted, and you are unstable, not knowing what's going to happen next. That can be minimal, and it can be in extreme, and the entire set of emotions are feelings of exposure. And one of the things we find in Jesus' words is just absolutely fascinating, even in this particular area. Let's look at the choices of exposure. The created condition of human beings is described in Genesis 2. As a matter of fact, many verses are given to this description. Adam has named all the animals, but there is no helper for him. And the word helper there doesn't mean second in command or somebody down to the totem pole. That word is used most often in the Old Testament for God as my helper. He is certainly not our assistant. He's not second in command. It is a word that means that person which helps you become everything you were designed to be. Adam could not reproduce humanity by himself. He couldn't. He was incomplete in his maleness, Males and males cannot reproduce. It's out of the design. Only a male and a female can actually complete the design. That's the way God made it. But in this telling of the, the uh, creation of mankind, Adam goes through the entire animal kingdom. There is no one fit for him to complete him, to make him all that he can be. So God causes him to go into a deep sleep, removes a rib, and fashions a woman out of it. Then comes the classic verse used in, in weddings all the time, the two become one flesh. Well, they already were one flesh. It was flesh of Adam formed into a woman, and now we have two separate beings that really are in the design of God, thoroughly human by God's design, one but only when they're together. How union occurs rejoins that separation. And then comes a very interesting statement, given the context of Genesis. A man shall leave his father and mother. Wait a minute, Adam didn't have a belly button. He didn't come from a mother. He didn't have a father and mother. His father was God. He was created by God, and Eve was created by God to create one union, but then scripture says that's why a man leaves his father and mother and cleaves to his wife to become one flesh. Because in God's design, he knew what he was doing. He created a man and a woman to be able to join in together and complete what he designed to fulfill it. Many verses are given, and then comes the classic end of chapter 2. 
the two of them were naked and they felt no shame. The word for shame there is bosh. Bosheth is a noun. Bosh is a verb. Only one time in the entire Old Testament is this word, this verb, bosh, put in what's called the hithpael. There's a prefix and a suffix that go into this, and it means to cause that action within themselves. To make it happen. When a person ponders something, you're given an equation or a problem or a mystery to solve, and you ponder that, you take time to think it through. That's the hithpael in a verb. Not just to think, but to cause yourself to wonder. To enact that verb within yourself in order to come to a solution. And the verb bosh in the hithpael means they did not shame themselves. They were naked. They looked in the mirror or in a pool of water. Or they looked at each other. They weren't hesitant. They weren't embarrassed. They didn't blush. There was no cause for them to feel unsafe or insecure in that moment. There was nothing antagonistic. There was no laughter. There was no pointing. There was no shame. They did not create a sense of shame within themselves. A fascinating statement. In the design of mankind, the possibility of shame existed in our design. But here, in the most risky moment, Nothing covering them. They don't need to avert their eyes. They don't need to close the door. They don't need to turn off the lights. There is no shame in them. And they do not drive shame in their own lives. Then the story goes on. In Genesis chapter 3, Eve and then Adam have eaten from the fruit of the tree that God specifically and in isolation commanded them not to eat. It was it an apple, orange, pomegranate? doesn't matter. There was one tree. He said, you can eat everything. You can have it all. But I want to know that you will obey me by faith. Listen to my word. I'm only going to ask one thing. Don't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It's not the tree of good and evil. It's the tree of knowledge. And the word there is experience. Don't experience good and evil. Listen to my word and obey me because you believe. But they didn't do it. And in a fascinating way in describing in Hebrew, they ate from that tree and their eyes were open. And what did they see? Ah, an apple. Disney's going to do something with this years and years from now. No, that's not what they saw. The serpent, he's a snake, he's a liar. No, that is not what they saw. They looked at each other and they knew they were naked. In that moment, shame arose. Guilt. That's what caused their embarrassment, their fright, their anxiety. They realized they were both naked. What's very interesting is, in Genesis 2, the word that is used there is arom, with an A. The word that's used here is, is erom. It's on the same basis, but a different vowel to prefix. The nakedness of Genesis 2 is an innocent nakedness. But the word that is used, these two words are, occur about 10 or 12 times in the Old Testament. Of a child that is naked, it is always arom. When someone has done what is wrong, it is nakedness arom. A nakedness with shame attached to it. Very, very interesting. And then Adam says, I was afraid. I, I hid. I have young grandchildren, and it's fascinating to watch as they move closer and closer to the dawning of guilt. 
of choosing what is wrong. When I see one of my grandchildren, they have, have cookie crumbs on their mouth, and I, I say, did you have cookies before dinner? They're still at the point of saying, yeah. No, no shame, no guilt. But you were told not to have a cookie. Oh, no shame, no guilt. But coming soon is the day when I see cookies on their mouth, and I say, did you have cookies? No. No. It's the hiding that expresses the guilt and shame. They know within themselves a choice was made. Now it's not I look in the mirror and I just see cookies. Now I see nakedness. Now I see it. The exposure emotions actually are good. Adam and Eve had kind of played with obeying God. They took it for granted. But when they were driven from the garden, now it became vital. They were separated from him. But it was the, the guilt and the shame, the anxiety, the unstableness, the insecurity of the world out there that, that causes mankind to quest for, for God because he has already been questing for us. It's fascinating in the story in Genesis is God does not simply rip open all the trees and say, aha, gotcha. He calls Adam's name. He waits for Adam to respond. He does the same for us. Though we feel terrible guilt and shame, he will not crush us. It's a good feeling because it brings us to God. We need him and we need him desperately. The New Testament passage that I chose, Jesus is speaking to the disciples, and he says five or six times, don't worry. Don't worry about what you're going to eat. Don't worry about what you're going to eat, to drink, what you're going to wear. Don't worry about tomorrow. You have a choice. You can choose what you're afraid of. As a matter of fact, throughout much of the New Testament, over and over and over. This counsel is given. Don't be afraid. Don't feel overwhelmed. Put, put your anxiety to the side and trust God instead. Cast your anxiety on God. All of those words of exposure feelings bring us to the point where we say, I, I can trust God for one reason. He's worthy of my trust. He is trustworthy. My safety and my security is in him. When I need help, it comes from God. When I am feeling put upon and destroyed, I know that my wholeness, I know that my completeness is in him. He is the one who has given me all that I need for my safety, for my security, both now and forever. The feelings of exposure are put in us, in essence, to create the need for healthy, strong relationships, both with those who we know and love and with our eternal God and Father. So Jesus can rightfully say, you have a choice. You have a choice about what you worry. You have a choice about what you fear. You have a choice about your phobias. You have a choice about your terror. You have a choice about your anxiety. You have a choice about your guilt. Trust me. I'm worthy of your trust. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, so many different uh, resources call fear a bad emotion. It is not bad. When there is a threat out there, it is really good to be afraid. When there are cars driving up and down the road and a child is learning how to ride a bicycle or a skateboard or walk, it is really smart to have anxiety about the road. When there are chemicals or things that we don't know what they're going to do to our bodies, we are really right to be terrified and to make sure that that is all put away safely and securely so that no one is hurt inadvertently. Fear is good. You designed it in us. It's when it gets out of control when we forget you, when we forget who we are and how we've been designed, fear takes over and becomes our God. 
rules our lives, tells us what to do. But you have not given us a spirit of fear. And you do not lead us to shame. All the ways in which we feel exposed bring us to wholeness, for our safety is in you. In Jesus' name we pray.
I'm just going to charge my iPad here for, uh, I won't be seeing any more music. <laughs> Sorry. I'm sure you have it all memorized. share our praises and our requests. If you uh, grabbed a bulletin coming in or saw the announcement at the beginning of our service, uh, it said to be sure to read the announcement that's in the bulletin. So if you haven't gotten a bulletin, you certainly will want to do that. Uh, late this week on Friday, I got a phone call just about noon from the, the agent from the Small Business Development Corporation who has been working with us, Florence uh, Worden. Uh, we started way, way back in April with her. We met with her in June. We met with her again in September. We met again with her in December. Uh, and then in January, several more meetings. Uh, we wrote it an extensive business plan, submitted to the banks. They said they wanted us to raise $300,000 and a whole bunch of hoops to drum, jump through. Uh, Florence said to me and Ed when we were sitting in her office, I really, really want to see you get this project done. You are doing incredible things. And, I, and I, people come in here with much less than you have, and they get loans all the time. So I really want to see you do this. She called me Friday. She said, I've talked to Dan Cubitt at the bank. I talked to uh, Jody Davies, who's our agent at M&T. What I'm recommending is that you raise $50,000, not 300000 
and trim your narrative to about 12 to 15 pages maximum. Just simply put out all the stuff we don't need in there. She said, send me your narrative, I'll publish it, and Dan Cubit said, that's what the underwriters want. That is what they want. So when she publishes her SBDC report and gives it to the bank, and I talked to Dan and verified this, he said, the underwriters will accept it. Which means, we need to raise $50,000. Now that sounds like an absolutely massive, un we can't do it, but we can. It is all of us working together, and anyone else you can talk to, think and pray very, very carefully and very hard. We're gonna be putting together a commitment from the leadership team first, and letting people know collectively your leadership is committed to this month, this much. Somewhere between five and $10,000 is my guess, but it might be more. And then we would have to raise, as an entire congregation, the remainder of that. We are so close that my thought is, if we're going to make this happen this year, let's get this done by February 28th. There's only a few weeks away. Maybe you need time in the next few months to put your finances together and get money out of a long-term savings or rob a bank or something. Whatever you need to do to be able to pull that together, I understand it may take some time, but if we have the commitment by the end of this month, and that goes to the bank, I'm gonna to talk to Dan Monday as to what the time frame is for us, but we are within reach. We are, they went from 300,000 to 50,000. We need to talk to Derek about what has come in. I know several people have, I received myself a check from somebody who's a friend of our congregation for $1,000. And they just said that I want to help you. So we only have 49 to go. Um, this is not somebody who comes to church here. They are not involved. Uh, they just love what we do. And they gave me $1,000 for our building committee, so, or our building fund. So the announcement is gigantic. It is, we have been waiting for, for this. And now it is within our grasp. So pray, think, speculate, wonder, plan, whatever you can do. And we're going to be talking more about this in the next uh, in the next few weeks as the details are refined. But I'll tell you, Friday's phone call was astounding. And you should have, I wish, wish I could have recorded how delighted this SBDC agent is that we are within grasp of being able to do this. So, so think and pray. That, that's the announcement. If you haven't gotten a bullet, then you want to pick one up. Other announcements are up there. Yes, that'd be fine. We have a Valentine's dinner tomorrow, right? Very good. Are there other requests you have you'd like to share tonight uh, as we sing and pray together?
uh, my, my sister-in-law Cheryl also has a egg-sized brain tumor. Um, it's a lymphoma. It is the only one they've looked uh, throughout her body with the scanning stuff that they have, and there's one, but it's very debilitating to her. She starts uh, chemotherapy, I believe, next week, but she has about a week for recovery, so that they're going to try and send her home, and we as a family are going to do 24-hour care uh, for about a week and just kind of make sure that she's safe and she gets the things that she needs. It's going to be an incredibly difficult week uh, for us as well, so keep uh, Pam and all of us and Cheryl Staines in your prayers. This is a tough time for us, too. Susan. prayer song tonight. Give me words to speak.
So give me words to speak To let my spirit sleep Cause I can't think of anything worth saying But I know that I owe you my life So give me words to speak To let my spirit sleep Father, there are lots of praises, and there is a lot of heaviness. We find 